online I read your first batch of cider you made with a friend was perfect. Yeah, it was the best thing I'd ever tasted. Uh, so I threw it away immediately. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right. I'm here with Andrew today. Andrew, thank you for having me here at Union Hill Cider. It's an awesome view. I'm looking out over. Well, I can kind of see the Columbia if I stand up. But anyway, enough of that. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got started making ciders? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Andrew Handley, and I run Union Hill Cider Company. Um, is, do you? <laughs> well, me, me and my three business partners. So it's me, my father, um, then Matthew and David Dobbins. Okay. <laughs> so it's not just me, but you know, I, I'm here talking today, so I get to kind of call the shots. Right? He, gets, he gets all the credit. How long have you guys been in business? So we started in 2018, like officially. So been making cider for three and a half years um, for sale to the public. But we kind of got started a little bit earlier than that because it takes five years to to grow a, an apple tree from planting it to actually being able to have full production. So we kind of had to have a, um, I guess, a, a period of getting ready to to start. So we probably started about three years prior to 2018, just kind of getting stuff ready. Mm -hmm. uh, but officially, you know, we kind of get everything together in 2018 to finally say, okay, this is when we actually are going to be about ready to start. And then in 2019 we had sat on our, our product long enough that we thought it aged well enough to actually sell to the public. Okay. Online, I read your first batch of cider you made with a friend was perfect. Yeah, it was the best thing I'd ever tasted. Uh, so I threw it away immediately. Because <laughs> it would ruin you for life if you would have had that. Nothing would have ever compared again. Exactly. So you just had to get rid of that. Just... What went wrong? Uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, one, apples are super important to what you use. Um, but two, temperature control is also really important. So what we did is read a couple things on Google real quick, how to make cider, you know, bought a carboy from Stan's Mary Mart and said, okay, and we put the apple juice in there, dumped some yeast in there and we put it in our closet. And so, you know, it's probably sat at like between 70 to 80 degrees, uh, it's through the whole fermentation, just totally boiled over and it was just awful, but we didn't know what we we're doing. Right. So it's like, that sounds like how you're supposed to do it. That should work. It definitely <laughs> didn't. Um, but we learned from it. We learned that that was not how we wanted to make cider and, and we wanted to actually do a, a much better job <laughs> in the future. So we kind of put the craft down for a couple of years. Uh, I just went back to being an orchardist, you know, I said, okay, like we obviously didn't do well at that. We'll probably just drink other people's ciders. Um, <laughs> And it was kind of right when the industry started to get going here and became more prevalent. So it wasn't until a couple of years after that that I had tried snowdrift ciders. And then I said, okay, this is good. Like, this is what a cider should be. And so from there, that kind of was where it reignited that, oh, we should maybe do something with cider. We we grow all these apples. You know, we have land. We have, you know, the resources to do, do this. Maybe we should actually look into this again. This episode's about you, but I'm going to ask you about Snowdrift, so I apologize because you brought them up. Yeah, no. What fine. was it about their ciders that you liked? Because obviously, well, I'm going to guess that wasn't the only cider you had tried in, in, in the interim. You tried other stuff. Yeah. But so what is it about Snowdrift that resonated with you? Um, you know, so they had a lot of body, which was nice, and that was different. A lot of ciders, um, you drink and it's like, it's gone. Okay. You know, they're very watery, um, and they had that tannic profile and a lot more acidity than a lot of other ciders did. And so it's just, it was a, a really interesting cider. Okay. And so it was just, it had a lot of characteristics that I enjoyed in, in drinking. And, um, also, I mean, as a, a newer drinker at the time too, you know, um, you, you want to find something that is, I guess, acceptable to your palate. Right. But also has more than more going on than just it's sweet, you know, sweet enough to, to get over the flavor of alcohol, <laughs> you know. All right. So that was an, a new inspiration to you to start up again. All right. Did you start? So you mentioned it takes five years for trees. So did you actually like plant the trees 
or did you start using fruit from other sources to get started? So we we wanted to do everything ourselves because I mean okay. that's kind of the the orcharding nature. It's like oh, if I can do it, why am I not doing it? And so it's it's really hard for us to to get around, you know, not doing something ourselves if we can. So what we did is we ended up going to to Peter over at Snowdrift and, and talking to them and saying, hey, we want to get into this. We want to grow apples. Um, and so what varieties should we be getting into? And so we had some discussions with them and figured out what varieties that we, that we wanted that they had. So we got cyan wood from them, kind of got our orchard planning uh, ready because we were planning on planting a 90 acre orchard. 90? 90. Okay. And so, but... The apple industry right now is is horrible. It is a commodity and it is hard to make any money at it. So we wanted to diversify. And so we said, okay, well, let's diversify by having some cider varieties because we're interested in it. And it's something that not a lot of people are doing. I mean, most cider variety, like orchards out there are like one, two acres, you know, so nobody's planting it in a big scale. So we wanted to see if we could do it in a larger scale and be able to kind of supply more people in the industry. So not only then you guys are also selling fruit to other cider makers. So that was the original plan. Oh, okay. And and we have been in <laughs> contact with uh, Tim over at Snowdrift and he started a couple different projects. And right now their current one is the source. Um, and so on, on a totally different story, I mean, we lost most of those orchards for fire blight. Uh, oh. Cider apples are very susceptible to it. Okay. And it once, and we had, about two really bad years is an industry in the whole um, where it just went right through all of our fields. I mean, when you get rain at just the right time during bloom, it just, and you get that infection in there, it just, it takes off. Uh, so we lost a lot of those orchards and we're kind of replanting and restarting. Um, but we learned a lot too about how not to grow this stuff and how to, it's how to take care of it and, and drip irrigation. And we use a couple, um, a different sprays now to help. So I guess you use a, a copper spray really helps to prevent against the spread of this bacteria. Okay. So we kind of, we've learned what to do to prevent this and to, to get a better handle on it. Uh, but it takes a lot of failure to get some success. You're stealing my questions from me. I love to ask what the failures are and what you learn from them, but you're sharing them up front. So, all right. Oh, we like to be pretty open. Yeah, all right. No, so, I just, like, no, cause you learn from, like you said, you learn from it. I love that when, when you say, oh, let's try blah, blah, blah. And you go, well, that didn't work. But from that, I did something else. Yeah. I've know? never had a major success unless I had at least two or three failures in front of it. And I think that's how everyone is. Um, it just depends on how open you are to, to share how many failures it took you before you got to that success. <laughs> So how many currently then, as of today, how many acres do you have growing right now? Uh, so right now it's probably, we've probably cut back to about 15 to 20, I think. Okay. Um, some, somewhere in that region. Okay. So, and we also had some varieties that just did terrible. So we had Garlington Mill um, and we just could not keep it alive. I mean, it probably, when we had that fire blight outbreak for about, it took us about three years to get it out of there. And by the time we got it all out of there, we maybe had a hundred trees left oh. out of the, I think five or seven acres we started with. So it's just, we realized in our location, this was not going to be a variety that we could keep alive and, and sustain. And it was too susceptible to, uh, to that disease. So we had to cut that out, uh, completely. So we kind of reshifted around our amounts of each variety that we decided to keep. Um, totally well on topic, but totally unscripted for you. Did, um, last week or, Two weeks ago in the Seattle Times, there was an article about there's this organization that fi- tries to find lost apple varieties. Have you heard about them? Oh, yeah. The lost apple. I think it's the lost apple project. Yeah. But they just found some new stuff down in the Palouse. Would you guys ever like try like reintroducing some quote unquote lost apple if if it were rediscovered? Would that be a. I think we'd be open to it. Um, it just depends on its growing characteristics and the fruit too. Cause, um, I mean, it's really hard to say what it's, what it's going to do in cider. So the thing that we do, that's a little different than other companies is there's some companies that'll collect as many different types of apples as they can. And they just make an amalgamation of, of everything they have, which can be really good, but it's hard to, uh, recreate the right. next year. So what we like to do is keep all of our, um, our products, or I guess our apple variety separate through fermentation and then blend at the very end so that way we can have a really consistent product okay um 
So let's let's jump to your cider recipes. You know, specifically. Can, no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> what was your first product? Uh, so our, our first product, we came out with uh, Pink Heart, Hopped and Hazy, and Hard Harvest were the first things because we wanted to just focus on three products and you know kind of have more than one, but not so many that you got lost and were like, oh, I have no idea what to drink <laughs> from these people. So what we did is we we took our so the first year's crop, so I guess it would have been the second or third leaf of the the apple trees. We took that crop, it was barely anything, but it was enough that we could kind of do some tests and see kind of what we liked and what we thought blended well together. So we took that all, kind of did some blending trials and said, these are the ones we really like together. We think this is going to be, you know, pretty good. We think this is what the market needs. So we brought those together and took those out to market and, and we've been really happy with them. And, and I think so of the people that get to drink them. You were not keeping these in your closet anymore. No, you, no. You've grown beyond that. So I guess as I tend to bounce around. Uh, caution. So you started, you launched with three, but building out the, where were you, where were you doing all the work at? So over, I guess over at my house, we have an old barn here. And so this used to be my, my grandpa's property. So in this old barn here, I asked my grandpa, I said, Hey, you know, we want to start the cider company. Can we convert your old barn into uh, you know, a place that we can do some production? And he said, yeah, go ahead for it. So we kind of remodeled the inside. We got some tanks from, um, I think it's the SS Brutech and, you know, jacketed tanks, like, I mean, little, I mean, they were half barrel tanks. Okay. Um, but so we wanted to be able to control the temperature of our fermentations you know, and be able to really keep an eye on stuff. So we did that and we had like a little walk-in cooler here also. So we expanded it. So I, I talked to our guy that does um, um, AC and he goes, oh yeah, it, it's big enough that you could probably bump that wall out and you'll still be fine. So we were able to, you know, expand our cooler and and basically start in this little barn and, and it worked out. I mean, it was just, it was just enough space that we could do everything we wanted to do and kind of get ready to, to launch into, into the market. So when you when you first did this, you said it was in your closet. It was seventy to eighty degrees. Now you're able to you were temperature controlling. What what's a good temperature for the fermentation process? So I like to ferment around like forty nine to fifty degrees Fahrenheit. So you were really out of that when when it was when you first started. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> what you do is you overstress the yeast when they're when it's that high, and I mean, because they just want to keep going and and keep eating. So. So you, just, I mean, and they'll put off off flavors and, and other things can go wrong and you'll have other kind of spoilage that'll happen too at those higher temperatures. Okay. So it's definitely better to be able to keep it at a low, like a nice, easy temperature. So those yeast can just take their time and, you know, don't have to stress when they do their job. So, I mean, really all you're doing is you're taking care of yeast in the tank. So how long at 49 to 50 degrees, how long does this process take? And does it, does it vary between what you're trying to do? Like does does this apple take longer than that apple? I mean, type thing. Yeah, so different varieties will take different amounts of time to to ferment, but usually it takes between a month to two months. Okay. Um, and then what we do too with these cider varieties is they're very tannic and they they come off very harsh, especially right after fermentation. So then what we do is after it's done fermenting, we'll crash our tank, try to get as much of the yeast out as we can, and then we'll hold it in storage for six to eight months, like minimum. Because that really helps those tannins to settle down and for everything to kind of, I guess, ease off and to kind of to mellow out. And then you and from there, you blend it into one of your products. Yep, yeah, yeah. And from okay. there, I mean, we'll keep them in storage. So throughout the year, you're getting something that's been aged even longer. And so we just we leave them as individual varieties in storage aging. And then we'll when the time comes oh, we need more pink art, then I'll pull off all those different tanks and, and blend them together to to make more. So how long can they stay in storage? And well, this, if you can't tell, I don't know much about your process, which is okay because if I don't, others don't. Yeah. So when they're in storage tanks, what temperature do you keep them at-ish? You know. So in storage, we keep them about 34 to 35 degrees. Oh, okay. Because we just don't want any... Um, activity with the yeast any kind of re-fermentation to start and we also don't want any kind of bacterial growth in there uh so i don't know if you know a lot about winemaking i don't know a lot about winemaking but what i do know is malic acid is one of those things in wine that can be uh detrimental because you'll have different bacterias and microbes that'll eat off that and use that as like a, a source of food if i if i'm getting that right but so apples are all malic acid 
Oh, right. So with wine, you have uh, tartaric acid and then you have malic acid in there. And they're trying to get rid of as much malic acid as they can because that's, you know, a, a dangerous thing to have in there. Right. Uh, with us, that's all we have. So it's like we really need to keep those temperatures low. And some people will use um, sulfites in order to kind of help stabilize their products. But we've never really loved doing that because I know some people have issues with it um, where it'll give them headaches and and just uh, we want to be, I guess, as natural as we can with our process. So we ferment with yeast and we call it good. So we try to keep our process as clean as we can so that we don't have any spoilage in the future. And then we keep our our storage at 35 degrees to, to prevent that. So how long can this stay in storage? Uh, if it's stored well, you could probably keep it in there years. Oh, okay. So okay. like we have some stainless steel tanks. And with those, if you seal them off, I mean, it, it'll last in there I mean, okay. a really, really long time. Uh, we also have some IBC plastic tanks. And those, you do need to move it out of there sooner than later because the plastic is permeable. So you are letting oxygen in. Um, and it, it will oxygenate your product. So really, once you got the pump primed and product coming in, you could start producing. But now what what you're blending today might have been last year's crop or maybe even a little bit older. Am I, am I, yeah. am I right now? Okay. Yeah. So like today, <clears throat> like say we're going to go make something today. You're probably getting something from a mixture of 2019 and 2020 crops. Okay. Um, just cause depending on, on what we have, cause some of it moves faster, some of it doesn't. And, and that actually is fine. I'm, I'm very okay holding on to cider varieties the longer I can because they just get better and okay. it just makes your product better. Okay. So like I blended up some pink heart the other day and I thought it was just phenomenal, but it's because it was all two years old that had been sitting in, you know, aging in storage okay. and we're just finishing off that last bit of it, but it made it even better. So I was pretty happy with that. What would put you on the spot? What's your favorite cider that you guys make? Even though we're only talking about three so far, I, you know, but so you might say one, not one of those three. I don't know. But do you have like your go to cider? Uh, it depends on the time of the year. So like okay. hot summer day, I really like the Hopton Hazy okay. uh, from the bottle. Pink Heart's actually one of my favorite from the bottle. I, it's slightly different than on tap. Um, and that probably is just due to pasteurizing, but I think it's really good out of the bottle. Okay. Uh, we do another one called whiskey business that we are just releasing now. We just got labels like two days ago, so that we'll actually be able to start selling. And that one I think is really good. So we, we took our barrel age. So we aged one of our products in red wine barrels for six, eight months. Okay. We took that, then we pumped it from those wine barrels into whiskey barrels from Woodenville whiskey and let it age in there for three months. Um, and it's actually, it's really good. A lot of notes of vanilla to it. So the, um, with that one, you're, so I'm, I'm confused. Are you, are you blending it before you put it into the barrels or is it just one variety that's in the barrel? So that one we are blending before we put in the barrel, okay. uh, just cause we want a more consistent product. So the and, blended product goes in and is barrel aged. Yeah. And then what okay. we'll do is we'll actually, before we decide to make more of that product, we'll go through and we'll taste all of our barrels to kind of see what what we think tastes better together because they they're all slightly different um just depending on what was in there what kind of red wine was in there and, and everything so we'll taste around kind of go okay this one's a little more acidic this one's a little more tame we'll kind of mix and match these you know two or three barrels okay. to get something we like all right how about winter time what do you like to drink during cooler weather i would say probably the barrel aged okay just because you get you know some of those more okay. oaky notes to it. And it's just, it seems to be more fitting. Okay. Um, and that could just be, you know. You're fooling yourself, maybe. Who exactly, knows? Exactly. Yeah. But who cares? Okay. So you started with three products. And the market received them well. And you guys are growing. Yeah. So today, as of today, the time of recording, how many, how many products do you have right now? See, I was trying to count them up before you got here because I was like, how many do we have? But I, I think it's between 10 and 12. Really? Um, yeah. And we're trying not to. We're at that point where it's like we don't want too many products where it's like you don't know what to choose from us. Uh, but we also want to keep anytime we get good ideas, we try them out. And if we like them, it, we want to be able to provide them to people. So it's we're at that really interesting point where it's like <laughs> I don't want too much stuff. But I also if it's really good, I don't want to deny people from having it. If I like it, then other people probably will like it. So we're trying to be careful now with not putting too much stuff out there. 
when we first came here, um, my wife and I ordered a flight each. So that way we could sample everything you had. And I can't remember if it was, is it four in a flight or five in a flight? Yeah, four in a flight. So it was eight. So we got, at that time you had eight. Yeah. And uh, I will confess, I am not a fan of the hopped and hazy. I don't know why it is about hops that in a cider that doesn't work for me. Yet everybody else that I know loves them. And uh, yeah, that's one of our, our ones that people either hate it or they love it. Yeah. And I can't tell you who that's going to be because I have people come up to me and say, I don't like IPAs. I don't like hops. And they'll try it and they'll love it. And then I have people, you know, that are yeah. totally fine with it and they'll come up and they don't like it. So, yeah, it's, it's very polarizing. But the people that love it love absolutely it. love it. So what other ones do you have that are polarizing to the to the population? <laughs> Um, I would say probably we have a, a single varietal porters and it's really good, but yeah. it's really tannic, really acidic. Um, and that one probably is polarizing. So I don't like to like for people that never drink cider, I don't love like giving that out to them first thing, but like, Oh, try this. So what do you give to somebody that's, you know, they, they come here first time and they're like, well, what, what should I try? You know, they got that confused look on their face and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I usually go with, um, Depending on if they like sweeter or drier, mm -hmm. that's kind of a base base point to start with. Um, but if they like sweeter, usually I recommend Pink Heart or Cosmic Rosé or Barrel Aged. Uh, those are really popular. And then uh, if they want something a little more dry, we go Hard Harvest or our DJ Dry. Um, and that usually is it sits about right. Okay. We have a new guest. What's your favorite? We're going to put you on the spot. You... <laughs> It's just going to be an onlooker. Uh, <laughs> nope. My favorite cider is probably our Cosmic Rosé. That one's also one of the most popular. So I, I feel like I'm in the majority because it's our, um, it's, well, it was our new, it was our January release, I think. Um, and it's 50% Red Flash and 50% Cosmic Crisp Apples. And it's just like a perfect, like crisp, tart, refreshing cider. And, but it still has, it still has some complexity because those red flush ap apples are so acidic and I just, yeah, I don't know. That we one's a lot of floral notes from too. Um, a lot of like hibiscus and you know, like uh, strawberry and like rhubarb to them. Yeah. So that's my favorite that's right now favorite. for sure. Is there one you, I don't want to say don't like, but what, what do you stay away from? Mm, you know, and you guys were just talking, I overheard you guys talking about the hop cider, um, hop ciders. I, I actually, I'm not a big beer person or IPAs or things like that, but I do like our hop ciders, but I go through phases where I'm like, not there's, there's seasons where I'm not really into it, but otherwise I, I love all of our ciders so far. Okay. So that's good. Good. Yeah. So you just said that one came out in January about how often are you guys releasing or do you have a release schedule? We're trying to get more consistent with that. Oh, uh, <laughs> because we have a lot of ideas and a lot of plans, but you get held up with, you know, making labels, getting them approved by the TTB. And, and so there's a, a big process that goes into getting your product like ready to, to go out there. So we have more ideas for cider than time to prepare everything, you know, through the legal routes and, and get everything all ready uh, to release to the public. TTB? Uh, it's the Tobacco Trade Bureau. So they're the ones that control uh, wines and mm -hmm. then ciders in our category, which is like between seven and eight and a half percent alcohol. So they got to approve your labels and they got to agree with everything you say. So we had a big fight with them lately over whiskey business because they didn't like that. We said whiskey. Um, Very misleading. <laughs> and so we, we had a lot of conversations with them because a lot of people like we've seen a tequila lime cider and we've seen like rum something cider. And so we, we've seen a lot of them that do that. And so we said, how do we like other people are doing it? How do we, you know, get to do that too? And, and they were very difficult to work with and, that's how it is a lot of times. I can't imagine a government agency difficult to work with. Sorry. Um, what? So currently, how are you guys selling your product? Just just here or are you in retail or are you on tap at places? And the reason I'm asking that is how how hard is it to get into those channels from the oversight point of view? Uh, so yeah, we're a little bit of everywhere. So we sell here at our tasting room. We're out in Seattle and in Tacoma and in Spokane. Okay. And we self-distribute. So if you see it somewhere, it's because we took it there. Okay. Um, but we, it's actually been fairly easy. People are really receptive to it, you know, and they are pretty excited to get new products. And so we'll, we'll go to these places and go into a bottle shop, say, and we'll 
hey, can we talk to a buyer? Can we talk to a manager? And and we'll get contact information. And usually people are really open to mm-hmm. just right on the spot doing tastings or talking to you. And and so it's been really uh, pretty easy and pretty fun getting to. Well, I'm going to put you on the people. spot. Where are you at in Seattle, Tacoma and Spokane? Since those are three big cities. I mean, yeah. Um, here, my wife probably knows. <laughs> <laughs> so we have several accounts over there and we actually just um, hired our our cousin to do some sales over there, which is super fun. So there's actually a lot of new accounts that I haven't been up to date on. Um, easiest places are like BevMo and Total Wine. So we are in those, those bigger accounts. Um, not all of our ciders are carried by them, but our main ones. Um, and then there's some fun places in Tacoma, like Edison city ale house. We've got, um, Oh, and now I'm going to totally peaks and pints, pint defiance, um, <laughs> over in Seattle, you've got like, um, there's crap, craft but it's like c c r f t they're called craft brewing it's like a bottle shop and then uh downtown spirits carries us in like more downtown seattle and then i'm trying to think black black raven brewing and then there's lots of different there's lots of different restaurants that carry us over there um or we're on rotation those ones i i'd have to look at our list but we keep everything on our website okay but yes, you can go to our website and we have like a where to find bottles and that is pretty up to date. It's like a little map and you can see in your area where, yeah. Where how, we're how's, how's, how have you done in Spokane? Ooh, Spokane's a new one actually. So, well, not new-ish. So like we said, you know, we only are the spring cider to where we go. So right. we have to do it physically ourselves. So Spokane, we kind of started at the beginning of the year. Um, and one of our partners, Matthew's one, Matthew and his wife, Kirsten, have been going out there. That one, I think we're still fairly small. Like I, I think they've only, they have family there. So really they, they kind of, it's like, a, okay, we're going to go over there and whatever restaurant we go to tonight, let's try to sell them some cider too. So that one, it, it's still just very few accounts. And I'm trying to think of the names over there. Do you have, I know, well, easy well, this, over there too, there's a total wine. Yeah, There's two total wines. So I know those for sure, but, but there's some small places too that are carrying us. Yeah. Spokane's become a new fun spot for me. I had to be careful. When in an early episode, somebody took offense to what I said about Spokane and actually wrote a negative review because I wasn't nice about Spokane. So oh, no. I'm not being nice now because I have to. I'm actually, it's, it's a fun, fun city. Um, well, that's great that you guys are, you're, you're self-distributing that. Do you think you'll grow into having, so you're not delivering it yourselves? <laughs> um, I don't know. It's tough. Distribution's tough. If you talk to it, anybody in the beverage manufacturing industry, they all are not very happy with their distributors. Oh. Um, it, it, yeah. So, cause it's kind of like a marriage and if you decide you don't want to be in it. Oh no. What, what I mean, <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean that in any kind of so weird. Unhappy. <laughs> That's not what I mean. What I mean by that is because of state laws, it's like getting a divorce. If you want to hook up with another distributor, let's change the topic. Um, I'll, I'll save your relationship. Let's Marriage let's. Counseling after this <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know that came off wrong. Yeah. But it's just the, the legalities of, of switching between different yeah, we're, distributors. We're, we're totally giving you a hard time. That was, that was beautiful. We'll be back after a short intermission. Yes. <laughs> Oh my god. So we're okay. In are you on tap in Wenatchee anywhere? Besides yeah. here? Yeah. Uh <laughs> so McGlynn's has been awesome. Oh yeah. They started I've had it us, like yeah. right at the start. Um they were like one of our, our best accounts because oh do you have something to say about oh, that? I was just gonna say no. This time of year they do um cider slushies too, if anybody's into that, which I think is really fun. Like Kind of like like the wine slushies, but they do them with our cider. And yeah, so just random side note on McGlynn's having us on tap to try their cider slushies. But yeah, they've been awesome. They carried us like right from the get go. And they, we've been on tap there nonstop since we opened. So we really appreciate uh, the exposure that they've given us and, and keeping us on tap. You can also find us up at like uh, Milepost 111. Um, let's see. Columbia Valley Brewing has us on tap regularly. And then... We've been on tap at Badger, Badger Mountain. Mountain and Wenatchee Valley Brewing. We kind of have been on and off. And- yeah. Yeah, with Wenatchee Valley Brewing, I think ever since the pandemic, we haven't been on tap there, but a lot of weird things happened. Yeah. So a lot of people really had to go, oh, we need to focus on our, our own products. So. so so just because it comes up almost every time now, 
How did the pandemic impact you guys? So it took our, we were doing before the pandemic, probably like 60% bottle sales, 40% keg sales, or maybe it was even closer to 50, 50. Our keg sales dried up. Okay. So we overnight, nobody wanted cakes anymore because they couldn't get rid of them. So we had to transition to like 90 to 95% bottle sales, which I wasn't too big of a deal. But what happened was, is it really throws your numbers off. So when you're selling kegs, you move a lot of volume. When you're selling bottles, you're not moving very much volume. I mean, not, not comparatively. Cause how big is a keg? So our kegs are either five gallons or 15 gallons. Right. And our bottles are 16 ounce bottle. If you like will. a seventh of a gallon. Yeah. Like per bottle. So yeah. So it really threw our numbers off. So we actually had a lot more cider uh, in our warehouse and cold storage than we were ready to sell. Cause we thought we were going to be doing a different kind of business. So that definitely changed our game up a little bit for a while. Um, do you think it's helped because you're you've been you were for I'm guessing you were forced to come up with new ways of doing bottle sales. Yeah. And so uh did you how do I want to say this? I mean, did, I think you probably started to reach a different audience. Yeah, well, we definitely branched out a lot yeah. more. Uh and we were willing to branch out more because we knew that we weren't going to come into any kind of supply issues. It's, we had a ton of supply, so we we knew that it was going to be okay to, to move ourselves out a little faster than we originally planned. Uh, the other thing it did, though, too, is our tasting room. We hadn't opened it at this point, so we opened it about in October, so like halfway through the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Great, great timing. Um, but that was also a way for us to to start moving through some kegs and, and be able to have a different venue. And, and it gave us time to focus on getting that ready and getting that, you know, able to be able to open that up so how's the how was how was the process of opening a tasting room flawless no problems uh definitely (laughs) it was different than we thought um we were going to build a building out here and do some different stuff but it turns out that you have to widen roads and get fire hydrants and equip your buildings with sprinklers and stuff and and so it became a way too expensive to do so instead what we said is okay we can't do original plan. It's too expensive. There's no way you can find the money. So we'll just take our old barn that we're, we're producing cider in. We had just made a new barn to, to make cider because we needed more cold storage. So that's over at my father's house behind one of his orchards. We were able to pull some stuff and put that new production air facility there. So we said, okay, let's take our old production facility, which is just a, a tiny. I mean, it's like a 16 foot by 30 foot barn. So it was a pretty small barn. And we said, let's remodel that. We'll do our tasting room out there. Um, and so we did it a little different than we had originally planned, but it's actually worked out pretty well. We have a really nice view here at the tasting room. Yeah. We did some terracing this spring so that we're able to kind of sit down into the yard and be able to, I guess, get, a, I guess, this, or have the view and be able to incorporate the view a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And we have some walnut trees out here too. So it's like this beautiful shady seating. So, so is that of, what these trees are as walnut? These? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have three big walnut trees. Yeah. yeah. And the shade is just amazing, especially in the summer. So I've always we always loved sitting out there uh before we had the tasting room, but it was on this steep slope. So it's like you could never do a table out there. So after being able to do these terraces, now you can sit out there in, in the summertime. It's just lovely. So how well was the tasting room received? I mean, you opened middle of pandemic, October. We had winter. Did that impact you at all? I mean, because to me, okay, this is the West Side guy. You know, I'm amazed at during winter we can get around over here. It's like even, you know, those streets are plowed, but you're you're not really out there, but you're not in downtown. Were people coming by in the winter? Yeah. In the winter, it was a little more difficult, but okay. we actually made it work. The only thing I didn't want to do was be open on any days where it was like really snowy. Sure. Because we have a, a hill coming into our driveway and... I've seen so many cars slide right to the bottom of that hill. Um, So that was something I knew we didn't want to do. We actually didn't have that hard of a winter. So we never had to have a day where we said, nope, nobody can come out um, (laughs) because it never really lined up that way. But we what we were able to do is we took our carport area and we put sheets of like a thick plastic sheeting and wrapped that around there. So we were able to have heaters in our carport area and it was still open enough that it's you know is outdoors got airflow going through there so we were able to sit people in here we got some of those uh those bubble pod tents Mm -hmm. like those clear ones and so we got three of those and and we reserved those out to people that wanted to come and and that actually worked pretty well 
and they were nice because you put a little space heater in there and it got to 70 degrees and when it was snowing and you were in there and you swatched the snow kind of flitting around on your tent it was really really pretty so we were able to make it work in the winter okay um hopefully we'll have some different plans for this next winter um and being able to use some more indoor spaces would be nice uh because it's it's still a small uh, area inside, so we couldn't really put anybody inside this winter. So you've terraced the area that we're sitting in. This concrete here is new. Yes. Because I think when we came during October, November, we... Yeah, so, we had gravel and fire right. pits out here. So we were sitting here the first... I'll, oh, I'll, yeah, what the heck? I'll make fun of myself. So the four of us were here, and I'm sitting... at. Probably at this specific day. No, I'm just kidding. But we're sitting right over there. And all of a sudden, you know, and we'd been here for a while, which implies that we'd been sampling your product for a while. Yeah. All of a sudden, I felt really funny. And I'm like, what's going on? I couldn't figure out what it was. Had a sinking feeling? Not at first. And then all of a sudden, I was like, my wife looks at me. She goes, I think he's having a heart attack or something. Because I am just like slipping over. Going, what's going on? I'm sinking into the gravel. And they were... we. I was laughing so hard I couldn't get out of the chair. And um, yeah, anyway, yes. So thank you for putting in concrete. <laughs> that's not the first time that's happened. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we had another friend who was sitting near the edge of the blocks and he tipped all the way over off, off of the, the seating. But we, we tried to compact it down a little bit more so that it wouldn't do that. But yeah, that wasn't that was an issue. It was pretty funny. So you you put in more concrete, you've terraced this. You're building a, a an amphitheater sounds large and it's I, it's like a mini amphitheater. A mini amphitheater, okay. Yeah, can't yeah so we're building that. We want to do more live shows out here and be able to host larger bands. Because right now, at our current tasting room, we can maybe have one or two people playing. And that's about the only size we can fit in here. Um, but be able to do big shows and have people out later into the evening is that'll the plan. Be, So that'll be this summer? Yeah, so I think right now what we have scheduled is August 6th. We've talked to Older and Wiser and got them... To, to come out and play. And so that's going to be when we. The inaugural thing up. The yeah. inaugural cruise. Everything will go well. I hope. But you guys have food trucks out here too. Yeah. We've had a couple food trucks. We've had. Um, well, you Birch, had your. Birch Mountain Barbecue. You had Chris your and dog, days. Chris and Bex, yeah. dog days. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and that and was. Has been awesome. Well, what was we awesome is all the dogs here got along. They all. Because that's a little risky at times. You don't know. Yeah. I got off to like a little bit of a rough start, but. For maybe a minute. It did? And we were really early. Well, there I was, I know there's. We had just one small tussle, I think, at the very, very beginning. And it was just because, you know, funneling into our tasting room, it's a small, it, it's a small enough space to where dogs have to interact. But I, that was the only one I saw all day. And it was like a dog growled at another dog. And that oh, was, yeah. that was about it. So there was, there was nothing serious. I think. But yeah, for like a seven hour event, I mean, to have like 30 seconds of dogs, oh, it was, not, not playing oh, with yeah. the others, not bad. <laughs> No, no it was and a I think great event. I think everybody had fun, and I like the fact that you guys are kid friendly and pet friendly. Um, yeah, what we, else? Well, I feel like I'm not asking something. There's got to be something else. What's What's the future look like for you? What's the crystal ball? Um, I mean, it's hard to say. We're just trying to constantly improve what we're doing. Um, so especially if you come out to the tasting room, it it seems like there's always something going on out here because we're just trying to to make our spaces as useful as we possibly can, um, and we're. I mean, trying to, to plant our trees and get them, you know, set up to to be producing and healthy. And so we're just I mean, we're trying to just proceed with with caution, but also to be able to take our fun ideas and and work with them. Will you ever do other fruit ciders? I mean, would you ever do a pear cider, a peri or anything? Or are you going to just stay with apples? We've talked about it. Um, our brand is very apple focused. Okay. And we do try to like showcase the apples we use. And so we don't grow any pears and either. We, our last pear orchard we had, we took out, um, I think it was like seven years ago. Or not, well, maybe it wasn't that long. Maybe it was only five years ago. And we built houses there um, oh. because it was right in the middle of, of town. So, in, and everything's getting pushed out of Wenashee into Quincy. And so most of our orchards are in Quincy. Um, I'm just, I'm not a huge fan of pears. Okay. And that's so fine. That, it makes it harder for me to be super enthusiastic. Yeah, about no, it. totally get it. And then we've tried some ciders with cherries before, uh, but when you ferment cherries, they taste like cough medicine. Some people like that. Uh, some people do. Uh, but so what, what a lot of people do uh, to kind of get around that is they'll back sweeten with just cherry juice. We've talked about that, but again, we're, we're so apple focused in our, our brand. We don't know if we want to 
you know, p- pull our brand away from that because that that is kind of what makes us special is that we're we want you to taste the different kinds of apples in our products. OK, no, that's that's great. So when you're not doing this, what do you do for fun? Uh, I don't well, know this, if you could this, hear them both chuckle when I said that. So uh. <laughs> this does take up a lot of our time. So working the orchard, then coming out here. Uh, but in our spare time, every now and again, we really like paddle boarding. I think that's a ton of fun. We do some rock climbing. So where's a good place to go rock climbing? Uh, well, the closest place this is probably going out towards the gorge to Vantage. There's some nice rock climbing out there. Leavenworth has a lot of really good rock climbing, but you need to know some people to kind of show you around to, to find a lot of those spots. We um, should say, I don't know. You're And then I got my pilot's license last yeah. year, so I do a bit of flying, which I really enjoy. I love that he says that super casually, like, yeah, you know, got my pilot's license while I was starting a cidery and all these things. And so is that how you're delivering? Is that how you're delivering ciders to Tacoma and Spokane and Seattle as you're flying them there? I've done one delivery like that. Uh, So we flew some stuff out to Cleelum the other day because I how did I hear about that? Somebody. Oh, I think we posted it on our Instagram. Yeah. But yeah, my cousin was over there and he had an account that he wanted to deliver to. And I said, oh, well, let me just fly that stuff over to you and we'll give you some of the other stuff you need. And it worked out okay. Uh, it sounded a lot more fun than the actual practicality of it. <laughs> well, the thing is, flying to Cleelum takes 24 minutes. And driving there takes an hour and a half. So it was pretty clear in my mind. It's like, I can save a lot of time if I just can go fly over there. Weight-wise, though. Uh, weight-wise, you are very limited in, in a little airplane. What are, you, what are you flying? I'm flying a little Tri-Pacer. I think it's a 1956 Tri-Pacer. So about the cheapest airplane you can buy. Um, and, and by 1956, you mean it was made in 1956? Made 1956, yeah. And hopefully it was updated before <laughs> then, too. After, <laughs> after, after that. After, after that. that, after that yeah. not, <laughs> not before, I guess. Yeah, after. I know nothing about airplanes, but that seems really old uh, to be airworthy, if you will. Well, what was nice about this is it sat in a barn for a long time. So it's a tube and fabric, and that's just kind of how you made them back then. Because Okay. Um, Aluminum is expensive and, you know, it was an easier way to make airplanes. Uh, but no, it's a, it's a good little airplane. It, ah, that's it, cool. It, well, airplanes are different because I feel like a lot of them. Yeah. Well, you got to stay every year. You got to longer than like cars. Or well, you have to cars. annual them every year. So they huh? are picked over a lot. And so you can't just, you know, park your airplane for a couple of years and then take it out for a spin. Like, you need <laughs> to have like every year a mechanic looks over it. Can you um, could you like pull a banner behind it and like union hill cider and fly around the area somebody could i think i might need a different rating for that oh okay uh, and maybe like practice a little bit so i don't like kill myself so where do you where do you fly out of here uh so i just fly out of wenatchee we'll go so on our orchard in Nadua, we have a little airstrip because my uncle is a crop duster and so they have a little airstrip right on our orchard in Mattawa. so every now and again i'll fly over there to go to our orchards because it's more fun than driving um, but yeah, a lot of just local flights. I mean, it's, we do it for fun. Do you fly with him? Yes. Begrudgingly. So sometimes we, yeah, we do. I mean, we've done a couple fun flights. I think the first, when he first got his license and we're all excited, we, um, flew up to Stahican. Oh, which that about killed me. Why? But it was terrifying. It's, it's a small, so when you fly into Stahican, if anybody's been up there, so it's above Chelan up in the mountains and, um, it's just, it's a very small. You got like small, of trees coming into the, the runway. So it, yeah, it. so it's in between mountains. There's trees. It's a small runway. So it's like, you've got to just like come in, drop down, land, and then like not hit the trees at the end of the runway. And, you know, it's, it was a little, it was a little scary, but we made it. It's he exciting. It. <laughs> he says exciting. I see. But what's nice about that is it's 40 minutes to fly to Stahican from here or from Wenatchee. Yeah. And to get there. Via car, it's like what four hours, five hours, right? Yeah. With the ferry ride, so it's like it's way quicker. That's and very it, cool. It's fun. It's we're trying to do it more. The plan is to you know be adventurous and go out and see more places in Washington. Well, and we just had our third child, so he's four months old now. But it's hard to get out and do a whole lot when you have a newborn. So that's that's been One slowing day. us down a little bit too. So it's just just trying to hang on with keeping the orchards and the cidery going. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, I expect to see you delivering product via plane. I I think that needs to be your guys' shtick. Yes, you know. I think I think that's got to be it. So you can only deliver in the radius that that plane can fly. Yeah, Yeah, and if you load it down with too much stuff. Yeah, how much how much can you carry? 
so I think I have a useful load of if I fill the tanks all the way up and I'm in there, probably 600 pounds, okay. which sounds good until you think about a half barrel keg is 170 pounds. So, I mean, you can carry like three of those. Three of them. You. So it's cost prohibitive. It's super cost prohibitive. We may need to get a new plane, you know, business expense. We may need to <laughs> <laughs> look into that. Yeah. Wow. So is there anything else? We'll wrap this up. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that I should have asked? I wasn't here for the start, so I'm not. I'm not sure if we um, missed anything. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if there's a whole lot else we need to cover. But um, we are in a state cidery. We grow all of our own fruit. We, That's awesome. We do everything by hand. Um, I know we're supposed to. We've been meaning to like push that more because when we started, we we didn't push the fact that we don't add uh, sulfite store product. We didn't really push the fact that we're a state. Like we grow everything ourselves. We bottle it ourselves. I mean, everything is is all so, done in house. Do you guys can it yourselves? So canning, we actually have uh, Kevin from Pair Up come over and he he brings a machine and he cans for us. Um, that's the only one we don't do ourselves. Okay. But he's an awesome guy and they do such a good job. It's like it's it's hard to be like, oh, let's let's go find a bunch of equipment and, you know, make our life <laughs> even more difficult when he comes in and does a great job with what he does and, and helps us out so much that that's the only one we don't do ourselves. OK, but but that's just one of those things that we just need to be better about uh, letting letting people know that. Well, let me ask this question. So you're, are you going to be planting different varieties in the future? Do you guys keep an, an open mind about that? Is yeah. That, you know? Yeah. So we have about 80 acres out in Quincy that we've planted um, cider varieties onto. And we're going to, as the years go on, get rid of more of the dessert fruit we have. Because okay. uh, the market's not there. It's really hard to make money with dessert fruit. And we would rather put it into cider so but it's just time and money and so as as the years go by we're gonna slowly keep pulling acres there and then replanting them with cider varieties so we'll keep an open mind to what those new varieties are in addition to older varieties too so is there one you're not growing now that you wish you were um you know i wouldn't mind growing like wicks and crab like i think that's a really nice variety um and then i've heard a lot of good things about other things like uh is it the hairy jersey masters people talk about I think that's what it's called. Don't quote me on that name. It's something similar. That's going to be the title of the episode now. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of interesting varieties out there. And, and there's a lot of guys that uh, that grow a lot of varieties. So what they'll do is they'll have smaller orchards and they'll plant like 30 to 40 varieties. And we thought that was just too much to, to get into. So that's why we only chose the ones that we really like to start with. Um, but as time goes on, we'll probably branch out a little bit more to, to the ones that we really like. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here. Or, well, since it's your your place, so thank you for letting me be here. Yeah, well, but for thank you for both being on and uh, all the continued success. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.